doesn't matter why I was there, or the air is sterile and the sheets sting. Doesn't matter that I was hooked up to this thing that buzzed and beeped every time my heart leaped like a man whose faith tells him God's hands are big enough to catch an airplane. Or a world. Doesn't matter that I was curled up like a fist protesting death. Or that every breath was either hard labor or hard time. Or that I'm either always too hot or too cold. Doesn't matter because my hospital roommate wears Star Wars pajamas. And he's nine years old. His name is Lewis. And I don't have to ask what he's got. The bald head with the skin and bones frame speaks volumes. The Game Boy and the feather pillow booms like they're trying to make him feel at home because he's gonna be here a while. I manage to smile the first time I see him and it feels like the biggest lie I've ever told. So I hold my breath. Cause I'm thinking any minute now he's gonna call me on it. I hold my breath cause I'm scared of a 57 pound boy hooked up to a machine because he's been watching me and maybe I got him pegged all wrong like Maybe he's bionic or some shit. So I look away. Like I just made eye contact with a gang member who's got a rap sheet the length of a lecture on dumb mistakes politicians have made. I look away like he's gonna give me my life back the moment I got something to trade. I damn near pull out my pack and say, Cigarette. But my fear subsides in the moment I realize Lewis is all show and tell. He's got everything from a shotgun shell to a crow's foot, and he can put them all in context, like, see this from a shooting range and see this from a weird girl. I watch his hands curl around a cufflink and a tie tack and realize that every knick-knack is a treasure, and every treasure's got a story, and every time I think I can't handle more, he hits me with another story. He says, see this from my father, see this from my brother, see this from that weird girl, see this from my mother. It took me about two days to figure out that that weird girl is his sister. Took him about two hours today after she left for him to figure out he missed her. They visit every day and stay well past visiting hours because for them that term doesn't apply. But when they do leave, Lewis and I are left alone. And he says the worst part about being sick is that you get all the free ice cream you ask for. And he says the worst part about that is realizing that there's nothing more they can do for you. He says, ice cream can't make everything okay. And there's no easy way of asking. And I already know what he's going to say, but maybe he just needs to say it. So I ask him anyway, are you scared? Lewis doesn't even lower his voice when he says, fuck yeah. I listen to a nine-year-old boy say the word fuck. Like he was a 30-year-old man with a nosebleed being lowered into a shark tank. He's going to write to it. And if it takes this kid a curse word to help him get through it, then I want to teach him to swear like the devil's sitting there taking notes with a pen and a pad. But before I can forget that Lewis is nine years old, he says, Please don't tell my dad. He asks me if I believe in angels. And before I realize I don't have the heart to tell him, I tell him not lately. And I just lay there waiting for him to hate me. But he doesn't know how to. So he never does. Lewis loves like a man who lived in a time before God gave religion to men and left it to them to figure out what hate was. He never greets me with silence, only smiles, and a patience I've never seen in someone who knows they're dying and I'm trying so hard not to remind him I'll be out of here in a couple days smoking cigarettes and taking my life for granted. And he'll still be planted in this bed like a flower that refuses to grow. I've been with him for five days and all I really know is Lewis loves to pull feathers out of his pillow. And watch them float to the ground. Almost as if he's the philosopher inside of the scientist ready to say it's gravity that's been getting us down. But the truth is... There's not enough miracles to go around, kid. And there's too many people petitioning God for the winning lotto ticket. And for every answered prayer, there's a cricket with arthritis. And the only reason we can't find answers is because the search party didn't invite us into us right now. The crickets have arthritis. So there's no music. No symphony of nature swelling to crescendos as if we've been halos into melodies that can keep rhythm with the way our hearts beat. 
so we must meet silence with the same level of noise that the parents of dying nine-year-old boys make when they take liberties in talking with heaven. We must shout until we shatter in our own vibrations, then let our lives echo and grow, echo and grow, echo and grow distant. Grow distant enough to know that as far as our efforts go, we don't always get a reply. But I swear to whatever God I can find in the time I have left, I'm going to remember you, kid. I'm going to tell your story as often as every story you told me, and every time I tell it, I'll say, see? There's bravery in this world. There's 6.5 billion people curled up like fists protesting death. But every breath we breathe has to be given back. A nine-year-old boy taught me that. So hold your breath. The same way you'd hold a pen when writing thank you letters on your skin to every tree that gave you that breath to hold. Then let it go. As if you understand something about getting old and having to give back, let it go like a laugh attack in the middle of really good sex. The black eye will be worth it. Because what is your night worth without a story to tell? And why wield a word like worth if you've got nothing to sell? People drop pennies down a wishing well as to the cost of a desire is equal to that of a thought. But if you've got expectations, expect others have bought your exact same dream for the price of the hard work, hang in, hold on mentality. Like I accept any challenge, so challenge me. Like I brought a knife to this gunfight, but the other night I mugged a mountain, so bring that shit I've had practice. Lewis and I cracked this world wide open, found the prize inside as we never lied to ourselves. Never told ourselves it would be easy or undemanding. So we sing in our own vibration and dare angels to eavesdrop and stop mid-flight to pluck feathers from their wings and write demands that God's hands take the time to catch you. So that even if God doesn't, it wasn't because we didn't try. I don't often believe in angels. But on the day I left, Lewis pulled a feather from his pillow and said, This is for you. I half expected him to say, See? This is the first one I grew.